favorite hymns in the hymnal. Number 332, The Cleansing Wave, I See, I See. Jesus, no, 
by Jesus crucified. The cleansing stream I see, I see. I plunge and oh, it cleanseth me. Oh, praise the Lord, it cleanseth me. It cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. Amen. Amen. And now a song that will perk us all up a little bit. Number 449, Never Part Again. Amen. Number 449, never part again. There is a land of pure delight where this eternal reigns in finite day excludes the night and pleasures vanish pain. We are traveling through sing our intro surely the presence of the Lord is in this place Yes, please. 
dad. The Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. The presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. So we're going to ask you to sit for a while while we wait on the platform party and we're going to turn our hymnals to number 530. It is well with my soul. Already, so we're going to again sing. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely 
Amen. Amen. It is indeed a pleasure to be in the house of the Lord on his blessed day. Somebody ought to say amen that we're here, that we're able to bless the Lord for all that he's done for us. And although we've gone through a tumultuous week, news and news and news and news. Uh, the good news today is that God still lives and God still reigns and that he's a blessing, that God blesses us. And so I was so glad when they said unto me, come and let us go into the house of the Lord. Father God, we are just so grateful and thankful that you are a God of mercy and a God of grace. A God that loves us so much that you allowed us once again to be able to come here into your place, into your house, just to be able to give praise and worship to thee. Amen. And Father, we've gone through a whole lot this week. Somebody here got a bad call uh, from a doctor. Somebody here had gotten bad news on behalf of a family member. But we're here to deliver good news, Father. That is, is that you are still in the blessing business. You've blessed us so much that you've given us a breath in our body so that we're able to come and just wave our hands and say, thank you, Jesus, for all of the blessings. And so, Father God, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day. We thank you for the opportunity given for us to be able to come and just say thank you for another day, for another Sabbath. We ask now that the Holy Spirit that is already here will continue to bless us so that when we shall leave this place, we will go forth rejoicing and telling everybody we see and know that we serve a God that is a good God. We pray now that you would save us into your kingdom when you shall come. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord our God? And who shall stand in his holy presence? Only he who has a clean hand, clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his, his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. The church is called to worship. To keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. A day, a day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all them that dwell therein. And they said in the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and the holidays. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Yeah. 
Good morning, happy Salvatore family. It is indeed a blessing to be in the house of the Lord today, would you say? Yes. Um, I would like to extend my welcome to the viewers that are viewing us live stream and those that are wanting to receive a blessing as well, those that are visitors, those that are members that can't make it here in the house that we are in today. And also, church wouldn't be the same without my members that are here that are in Anchorage. And it's a blessing to be home. And it's a blessing to be amongst the living. So I just like to thank God for sparing me. Day in, day out, my job has been getting more and more dangerous. Uh, accident happened yesterday with a forklift. One of my coworkers hit a truck. And, you know, it's a blessing that no one is hurt. And also me dealing with reptiles, almost getting bit by snakes and uh, spiders under trailers. Uh, I think God has spared me and kept me out of harm's way. So I would just like to um, thank everybody for being here, taking their time out of the week to give God his time because he deserves it. Oh, everybody smile our theme song. <laughs> Everybody smile, smile, everybody smile, everybody smile, everybody smile. Let us greet somebody in Jesus' name. Let us tell them that you love them in Jesus' name. Tell them we can work together in Jesus' name. Everybody. Our opening hymn is number 422. We invite you to stand as you sing with us. We're marching to Zion. Before we reach the heaven 
dirty fields or walk the golden streets or walk the golden streets we're marching to zion beautiful beautiful zion we're marching upward to zion the beautiful city of god then let our songs abound and every tear be dried. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to heavenly Zion, the beautiful city of God. Will the church open their Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 11, verses 17? I repeat, 2 Kings chapter 11, verses 17. Say amen when you have it. Amen. And Jehoiadiah made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people that they should be the Lord's people between the kingdom also and the people. May the Lord a rich blessing to the reader. We have come to the time in our worship service when, you know, we are here to petition the throne of God as we come before the king of the universe. We know that you know, a scepter has been extended to us because he said to him, said, in the, in the word of God, he said, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And he gave us the Sabbath as a, of the covenant that he promised to meet with us and that he will promise to tabernacle with us. And because of that, this morning, we are here to meet with the king of the universe through the medium of the Holy Spirit and through our, our petition and our prayers. So that sometimes we do not know what we ought to pray for, what to pray for as we ought to, but the Holy Spirit make intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. So I can, I can see the faces of all of us are here, but the needs, I can't fulfill those needs. I do not know what you have gone through this week, but God knows what you have gone through. And a lot of us have difficulties that we are facing in life, maybe sickness, maybe death, maybe a joblessness, maybe a homelessness, maybe some disappointment. But, you know, it says there is no pain that God does not hear or feel. So he knows what we are going through, and he understands, and he promised that he is the bomb in Gilead. So as we come this morning with our perplexities and our worries and our fears and our petition and our praise. Let's not forget our praise because as Lamentations say, it is of the Lord's mercy why we are not consumed. And the Apostle Paul said, it is by him that we live and move and have our being. So this is what we are here this morning to give thanks and to pray and to just lift up our hands, holy hands to say, God, you have been good to me this week. Let us kneel as we petition the Lord. Now, now dear Lord, Lord as we pray, take our hearts and minds far away from the press of the
Let people everywhere join us now as we come to you in prayer. In the quietness of this moment, let us all be hushed that we might hear you speak to us. Speak, Lord, your people is listening. We come this morning with our, with my perplexities, with my fears, with my woe, asking for forgiveness for my sins, asking to be cleansed, to be washed, and to be made holy, that as we lift up the prayers of your people, their prayers will be accepted upon your altar. Lord, because we do not make anything holy, it is you who is able to make holy, Lord, and we come this morning now to be transformed and to be reformed. Lord, we ask you now that even now as we kneel, as our faith differs, so our needs. And Lord, we know that you are able to meet every need here. You said your hands are not short, that you cannot reach us. Your ears are not heavy, that you cannot hear us. But Lord, you said because of our transgression. We have separated ourselves from you. And Lord, as we come this morning, knowing that, oh God, we have done wrong. We have walked contrary. We have speak words that are unkind. But Lord, in mercy, your mercy are endured forever. Your mercy are here this morning, and we are here to say to you, Lord, please forgive us and accept our prayers. Accept our word of sorrow. Now, as we present your people, Lord, we ask you now to tabernacle in this place. We ask that your presence will in, in, envelop here. And Lord, we are here this morning not by choice, but by divine appointment. You have said, come unto me if you are labor and you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You said, oh God, though our sins might be as scarlet, they shall be like snow. They promise, you promise, oh God, that there's nothing that we can ask for in your name that you will not fulfill those promises if we ask according to your will. And this morning we are here, this morning asking for your salvation, asking for your forgiveness, asking for healing, asking for strength to overcome the, the things that beset us, O oh God, and help us, O oh God, to live and to walk circumspect. And it's only by your grace and by your strength and by your mercy we can do that. Because you promise, O oh God, to enlighten us, empower us, and to send us. Lord, give us a burden, O oh God, that we might reach those unreachable, that we might touch the, those who, O oh God, are falling down. We might lift up the, the feeble hands. This morning, we come here this morning, not because, O oh God, we want to be here, but because of the invitation that you have extended to us. We come this morning because we know that you're going to be here. We come this morning knowing that the Holy Spirit, oh Lord, are here interceding on our behalf. We come this morning because you have, you are the one who call us into righteousness and you promise to hold our hand. This morning we ask you, God, remember the speaker that will speak for the moment. Lord, we, you, you know him. Before he was born, he will be, oh God, you said he was graved on, on, on the palm of your hand. Lord, and you said, oh God, in your word, oh God, you will not leave him without a word. And this morning you give him a word for your people. And we ask you now. Let him be a nail fastened securely, O oh God, on this wall. And from that nail hung the picture of your face, your lovely face, and your grace and your mercy will pass before us, O oh God. As Moses asked, see your glory. Lord, we ask you this morning, reveal your glory to us. Through the person of your servant and through your word. As you spoke to him, speak, he will speak to us. And Lord, we ask you now. Even now, tabernacle with us. Send, you the whole, send us the Holy Spirit. Extend the scepter of your, your glory to us. That, O oh God, our prayers and our prayers will be accepted. And Lord, when we shall have left this place today, our heart will burn within us and we will know that you are here. Lord, it's only then, O oh God, our spirit will be revised because you promised to be with us. Bless us, heal us, Forgive us and save us to this end 
with the forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Almighty Father, hear our prayers and bless our souls that wait before Thee. We need wisdom, we need power, and a true love for each other. We have had so many big but empty words. So we come before your face, asking for your grace, bring your people to a state of kingdom life, restore your church again. Touch your people once again with your precious holy hand, we pray. Let your kingdom shine upon this earth through a living glorious church, not for temporary deeds, but to restore authority and power. Let a mighty rushing wind blow in. Touch your people once again. Lord, you see your tired servants and the broken, wounded soldiers. How oh, much we need your precious healing hand. We need the power of the cross as the only source for us. When we stand up facing final battle cry, restore your church again. Touch your people once again with your precious holy hand, we pray. Let your kingdom shine upon this earth through a living glorious church, not for temporary deeds, but to restore authority and power. Let a mighty rushing wind blow in. Touch your people once again. Let a mighty rushing wind blow in. Touch your people once again. Happy Sabbath, church. 
It's time of our service where we return our tithes and our offering. And I'm going to read from Malachi 3, and verse 10. It says, Bring ye all the tithes in the storehouse, that they be meet in my house. And prove me now, say the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be enough room for you to receive it. All right, we have three methods of how we can return our tithes and offering this morning. So we can do it. can see this one. Let me help you. So um, we can return our tithes and offering. Um, if you're here in person, you can um, put it in the box towards the door when you're leaving. And also, you can do it on um, Zelle, which you use the, the website is acreage, sda21 at gmail.com. And you can return by mail, um, Loxahatchee, Florida. The address is P.O. Box 1101, Loxahatchee, Florida, 33470. So another time, if you're here, you can do it in the box towards the door, or you can do it by, via Zelle, acreagesda21 at gmail.com, or mail it to P.O. Box 1101, Loxahatchee, Florida, 33470. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, so God has brought us into his house another week, another Sabbath day, and he has never disappointed us. He always has a word for us. And uh, today, uh, in the personhood of Elder Albury, and uh, he's no stranger to us here at Acreage. He has spoken to us on numerous occasions. Uh, um, I know him from uh, going to Del, Del Rey, um, I would call DOZ, a long time ago. And uh, he's still standing tall uh, uh, for God. And so this morning, as he speaks to us, I invite you to hush a word of prayer on his behalf, uh, that he will be humbled in the presence of God and his people. And the, the word that he speaks will not be his, but coming directly from the throne room of God. And so before he comes, I will uh, sing yet again to prepare your hearts for the message.
and it flows from deep within. There is a fountain that frees the soul from sin. So fly. There is a river that never shall run dry. Now there was a thirsty. And she was drawing from a well. You see, her life was ruined and wasted, and her soul was bound for hell. Master, and he told her about her sins, and he said, "Child, if you drink of this water, oh, you will never." Again, there is a river, and it flows from deep within. There That frees the soul from sin. Oh, come to this water. There is a vast supply. Amen. Elder has so many talents, I was unaware, Elder. For all of these years that I've known him, those hidden talents. I say, thank you so much for the blessing. Because there certainly is a river that flows from the throne of God. 
And we know that that river will never, ever, ever run dry. I don't know about you, but I'm just, I'd be so excited when we finally get there. And all of the cares of this world is all over with. And we're standing before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. I can't even begin to comprehend what forever is, but I'm willing to go into it. As long as I'm with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's good to be with you again today on this blessed Sabbath day. Where we uh, just put all of our cares aside and we come to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I'm going to invite you, if you will, to just turn to me, turn with me to the book of 2 Kings. The book of 2 Kings, we're going to go to uh, chapter 6. Book of 2 Kings, chapter 6. We will look at a few texts of scripture found there, beginning at verse 12, Second book of Kings, chapter 6, and we will read verses 12 through 17 responsibly. I'm going to invite you to just stand with me as we enter into this reading of the Word of God. And when you have found it, just say amen. Amen, amen. and stand with me as we read responsibly, Second Kings, chapter 6. Verses 12 through 17. Baba records there, and one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou hast spoken in thy bedchamber. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, he was old and the host was not past the city, both with horses and chariots. The servant said unto him, A bad one, my master, what shall we do? And he answered and said, Fear not. But they that be with us are more than those that are against us. Altogether, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and fire round about Elisha. I've entitled our message, Do You See What I See? Do you see what I see? Father God, we are grateful and we're thankful for your kindness and for your mercies and for just the opportunity to be able to come and to share these words. We pray now, Father God, that you will open our minds and our understanding so that we will understand and know where we are in reference to a point of time. We know that you're soon to come, and so we're praying that you would have also all of us to be ready. We ask now that you would bless these words, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. He has decided that he must be caught at all cost. So this man decides, this king decides to declare war on his chief political enemy. And he has decided that he will take him down by any means necessary. And he has decided that anybody who gets in his way will be taken down because of his plans of expanding his kingdom. He is carrying out guerrilla warfare with countless surprise ambushes. But somehow every time the Syrian king plans to ambush the children of God, somehow God's people learn all about his plans and they manage to avoid it. Stay with me. Finally, the king of Syria had had enough. So he calls an emergency meeting of his military cabinet. And he looks at them and declares that one of those in his cabinet is a traitor. And he declares that something needs to be done with this man who keeps telling everybody about his military plans. So when the Syrian king finds out that his plans has been revealed, he gets angry and he calls his servants. And he wants to know who this double agent is that's inside of his cabinet. Are you with me? He wants to know who is it that's keep giving away all of his plans. He has decided that somebody inside that room is a double agent and he has to get to it. Who is this man that keeps betraying me? He keeps asking himself. Now he has decided that somebody has turned into a whistleblower and has gotten all kind of information to Nancy Pelosi. I mean has gotten all kind of information uh, to, 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 to the king. And so he wants to know now how do I go about making sure that this does not happen again? 
And so while he's now getting ready to decide and to get involved in what's going on, he was daring anybody that you would stand up against me. He has become furious that somebody would dare to go up against him and, and what he was trying to do. He, he has thought that all of the dirt he has gotten on everybody would allow him to do everything and anything he wanted to do. Stay with me. He has decided that somebody has to be prosecuted because of this. His attorney general got involved and began to try and take down people. He had uh, his, his, all of his, his friends do things. He even had a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, he even had another person who was in charge of housing who has decided that if I can't get him that way, I'll just get him through their housing. He has decided that these folks have to be taken down. And so one of the officers... Uh, who obviously had some intelligence sources inside of Israel, uh, speaks up and replies, Your Majesty, it's not one of us. It's that prophet Elijah who tells the king of Israel what's going on. I, I don't know how he knows everything. I don't know how he gets all of this information, but somehow he knows everything that you talk about, and he shares it with the king. I I I maybe in your bedroom when you have a little pillow talk with your wife, so maybe he gets a little wind of that while you're having these discussions and he gets the information back to the king of Israel. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe there are some secret recordings uh, that, uh, that, that you keep away locked in a secret vault that somebody has broke in, uh, although you had the highest national security rank and you had it locked under key, uh, some, maybe you transported it down to Mar maybe you transported it down to another place and somebody got a hold of the information. Word comes back that Elisha is staying down in Dothan, a small village about 10 miles north of Samaria, the, king, the capital of Israel. The Syrian king decides to undertake a, a daring military mission. He has decided that he's going to go down and he's going to get this man and he's going to bring him back at all costs. He has decided there was nothing going to stand in his way of getting that man who keeps revealing his secrets. Uh, so he sends down and uh, he goes down and he is planned now to go down. He's going to send all of his best military men. He's going to send the, the Navy SEALs down to get him. He's going to send army rangers. He's not going to entrust this to just anybody. He's going to send the best military he has to go down to get one man. He does not remember that somehow this man knows everything about him, but yet he's going to try and plan a, snack, a, 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 a secret attack. So, so see, see that, that's how it is. See, when the devil uh, decides he wants to try and get you, He's going to come at you, although he knows already the God you serve is able to provide for you a way of escape. But because he is so committed to bringing you down and bringing about your demise, he's going to try it anyway. But what you got to understand that you serve a God much bigger than your enemy. And so whenever your enemy decides they're going to take you down, you just tell them, you go ahead and try. I'm going to let God fight this battle. So he has decided that he's going to go down to Dothan and he's going to get it. Uh, and, and so he, he sends all of his military down to go get this one man. And so, I, I, but, but you got to understand, see, that, see, see there are times that, 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 that we find ourselves in situations where we have gone to sleep. Amen, somebody. Yes. And, and I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking inside the church. We have gone asleep. And whenever you fall asleep, it makes it that much easier for your enemy to sneak up on you. And it's time for the children of God to wake up and understand where we are in point of time. Amen, somebody. So he has decided, whatever it takes to get him, I'm going to go down. And see, whenever you fall asleep, uh, then the devil sends your enemies in bunches. Amen. Uh, whenever you're not on God, it seems like every time you turn, there's somebody or something attacking you. And that's because you're not asleep. You have fallen asleep. See, but when you are awake, you can see the enemy come. And when you turn from side to side, you can see him coming from side to side. But when you are asleep, you don't see the enemy coming your way. So the servant, so the devil sends the enemies down. Now, the Bible says then that there in the reading that the servant, uh, Elijah's servant, goes out one morning, as he does every morning he goes out, perhaps to get a daily walk. Uh, maybe he went out to pick up the, the morning paper so that he can get caught up on all the latest news. Uh, but when he looks up, all he could see, the Bible says, was a mass of horses with soldiers ready for battle. He had sent the green berets in to get Elijah. 
He saw the Lord's, the Lord's swords and spears, the thick breastplates and helmets designed to protect the vital organs from the arrows and swords that the enemy might send their way. These are chariots that carries the best snipers of the day uh, and, and, and spears. And, and they have all of these folks who are trained in military might. Uh, they send these people down to get Elijah because the king has become fed up with this man who keeps revealing his secrets. And so they surround God's children with all of these folks who have come now to destroy them. Servant looks and he sees all, all throughout the mountainsides. He sees nothing but the enemy everywhere he looks, so he becomes a little alarmed. And the Bible says that he goes back inside and he gets the message to Elijah. He goes in and perhaps Elijah was there asleep. See, you can sleep as long as you're sleeping and you know that you trust in God. See, see, there's a time when you can fall asleep, when you've already given your problems and your troubles over to the Lord and you've already told him, I can't handle this. And he's already told you, I got your back. Then you can go ahead and rest a little while. So Elijah was not concerned. Elijah, the Bible says, was there in the house. Perhaps he was asleep when the servant went in. And so the servant goes in to understand, understand. The prophet is asleep inside the house. The same prophet who multiplied a widow's oil so great that she was able to sell it and pay her creditors off a second Kings chapter two. The prophet who raised the woman's son from the dead, the same son he prophesied would be born. It was the same prophet who witnessed the there in Gilgal as he took meal in a pot that was poisoned and by some strange wild gourds and he threw in some vines and took the death out of the pot. This same uh, Elisha who was there uh, when a borrowed ax was lost in the water and he threw a stick out there and the ax floated up to the top, rejoined itself with the wood, and he gave it back to the owner. It was this same prophet who had fallen asleep. He was able to sleep because he knew who God was, and he trusted God to deliver. It was this same servant, Elisha, who watched as he healed a leopard uh, who was dipping seven times in the Jordan. This same servant who had witnessed his master, he had witnessed Elijah do all of this, but yet when he sees all of the enemies, he becomes a little concerned. He becomes a little fearful, although he had witnessed the power of God already. Why, why, why is it that, that every time we get in trouble, we demand God performs a new miracle in our life? Why can't we enjoy and draw from the experience of what God has done in the past for us to get us through our present times in trouble? Yeah. And we, we tell God at every juncture, I know what you did yesterday, but yesterday is gone. I need you to do this miracle today. Yeah. I, 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 this is a bonus. I, I got some information for you. If ever you're looking for God to bring about a miracle for something that you yourself can do, keep waiting. Keep waiting. If you, see, see, God does not perform unnecessary miracles. Uh, are you with me? See, when God has empowered you to be able to handle your own situation, he's already done it for you. The problem is you refuse to engage in bringing about your victory. How, how, can, can you imagine if somebody needed a job to feed their family? And God spoke to them and said, you know what? I got a job already prepared for you. All you got to do is go down and, and, and interview and get the job. But you sit home on your couch and you're saying that, God, you know, I'm, I'm just going to trust the Lord. Uh, I, I'm just going to believe that God is going to bless me with a double-figure job so I can buy that brand new house. You know, houses are expensive now. And I'd be able to get an electric car. They cost a little bit, but at least I won't have to buy gas any longer. And so I'm trusting God to do all of this for me, and, you leave, and you're sitting at home on your couch doing nothing. Wait for God to bless you with that double-figure job sitting home on your couch. See, see we, we expect God to go down and fill out the application. We expect him to go down and, and do the interview, and we expect him to drive us to, on our first day to the job. See, see, we want God to come and bless us, and we don't get involved in bringing about the blessing. For, for God feeds even the birds of the air, but he will not take worms and throw in their nest. You got to go and get what God has prepared. Amen, somebody. He knew that this prophet had the uncannily ability 
to know the plans of the enemy. So one day the king of Syria convened his military council, saying such and such a place will be my camp, verse 8. But somehow Elisha gets wind of the enemy's plan and got a message back to the king of Israel saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. At all costs, king, avoid that place because it's full of enemy. See, when God tells you to avoid your enemy, leave them alone. Some of us are so big and bad and bold, now I'm going to take my enemy down myself. She knew she, when she did that, that it was wrong, so I'm going to deal with this. Every time I turn around, he's trying to get me fired from my job. I know he's my enemy, so I'm going to deal with him. I, I, you you got to get out of the way and let God deal with your enemies. If God tells you to go take down your enemy, then go take him down. But if God says, I got this, get out of the way and let God be God. He has been told about the enemy. He has even seen the devastation left behind whenever his enemies would show up. So he allowed the power of the enemy to steal away his joy. How is it that we witness the power of God all the time in our lives, but yet every little distraction takes away our focus from the power of God? How is it that we allow the devil to steal our joy? We, we got to learn that even in adversities, we got to say, I'm still going to trust God. Even when we get bad news that a relative has just died, we got to say, I'm going to trust God even through the valley I'm going to trust him. For I know that my God is able to bless me, so I'm still going to trust God even though I'm going through this hard time. For the God we serve uh, is not a God that just blesses in good times. He blesses us in bad times as well. See, see you got to understand that diamonds are not made by just digging this ugly rock up out of the ground. See, diamonds have to go through extreme pressure. Are you with me? In order for the diamond to have all of those nice edges and prisms to be able to shine like it, sh it normally would so that they can cut it and put it into that nice little piece of gold that you have on your finger, it goes through some hard times. It goes through pressure. It goes through cutting in order to get it to look like what it is when you see it. So there are times in the Christian experience we're going to go through some pain. We're going to go through some trials. We're going to go through some suffering so that we can come forth as diamonds. So he had allowed this servant, had allowed the enemy's presence to cause him to forget about how God blesses and how God had done all of the good things they had done for them to car, uh, in the past. Now, oh, I, I understand, I understand that even today we have become a little discouraged just like they did in this day and time. We have become a little discouraged because we now live in a nation where an ex-president wanted to be king. Uh, uh, stay with me. So much so that he felt that he could run gunshot over the Constitution, break all kinds of laws, appoint wicked judges to the unsupreme court and federal bench, corrupt so-called vice presidents, take over a party who pretends to love God. Are you with me? Yeah. Uh, elders not getting political. I'm trying to bring you to where we are in point of time. Are you with me? Yeah. A president who walked around saying he's going to make America great again. Yeah. Let me tell you about great again. I, 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 I'm not an English teacher. Sometimes my syntax is a little bad, Elder. But I'm good, I, I'm good enough in English to know that whenever I hear somebody say, again, it means what? Something has already been before. And so whenever I heard that slogan, in my dumb little mind, Elder, I started saying to myself, what period of time in America was so great that we want to replicate it again. What period of time? Let me just show you. There was slavery. There was reconstruction. There was the Industrial Revolution. There was Jim Crow. And let me tell you, it was not good for me and you. There was nothing good about the good old days. I sat at my grandfather's feet and listened to him talk about the good old days, when America was great, when you and I had to get off the sidewalk to let somebody buy, couldn't look in their eyes. 
Let me tell you about the good old days when America was great. Are you with me? There was nothing great. When, when some folks had to walk around with one pair of shoes that had holes in them. Have you ever been in that situation before? Well, all you got is one pair of shoes, and so you take some, some plastic, and you wrap it around the shoe, and you tie some stuff around it, and you walk around puddles to make sure that the water don't get in your shoe. Uh, are you with me? I, I, I'm talking to the wrong people today. I, I, I know that we're so affluent nowadays that we can't remember. Uh, some of us choose to forget the past. See, when you forget the past, you run in jeopardy of repeating it. And so I asked the question to every supporter uh, that I ever ran into, tell me what period of time in America do we want to repeat again? America has never been as great as it is right now for being you. A period of time that we live in now, where so-called Christians sat silently by as a dictatorship was in the making. And you got to understand, dictatorships do not allow you to worship freely according to the dictates of your conscience. In totalitarian regimes, just go and move there and find a Seventh-day Adventist church. Go find one. And when things begin to happen, see, we talk all the time about an Adventism, about the day that's coming where we won't be able to buy or sell. Stay with me. That we won't be able to buy or sell when the mark of the beast will become so pronounced that it's going to prevent us from being able to worship. They're going to chain the doors and so forth, but you and I are sitting in a time when they're trying to put it in place and we are asleep. Just like they were here in our scripture. Bring back that time again. Do you realize that in America, there was a time when people were persecuted because of their religious beliefs, they called them witches at the time. Just go and read about the Salem witch hunts that took place in America. And now we want to relive that period again where evangelicals watch as a golden image of an ex-president was brought into their meeting. And after the initial shock wore off, they begin to go over and kiss it. Make America great again? America. Bring back that point in time again, and maybe this will finally sink in for you. Bring back that time again in America. When white evangelicals and elder is not being racial or anything else, I'm just letting you know about that great again. When folk would go to church on Sundays, have Sunday morning worship, and a lynching for entertainment in the afternoon. Yeah. In America. Yeah. When America was great. In this nation, that God raised up to become his last bastion of righteousness, Revelation 12, on earth, that would spread the gospel like no one has before and no country has ever existed that has spread the gospel of Jesus Christ like America. The one nation under God now has, has a political party that is that uh, so-called evangelicals who support their discriminatory laws, bigots and racists and conspiracy theories, cure nonsense. Do you see what I see? This lamb-like beast, Revelation 13, 11, has begun to speak like a dragon, previously led by this incompetent and, 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 and penitent person who would take little babies, flee in persecution, and lock them up in cages and give them mylar blankets to sleep on in America. 
This country with that beautiful woman out in the harbor, New York Harbor, uh, with, saying to it, bring me your tired, your huddled masses yearning to be free, the wretched refuse of your teeming uh, uh, shore. Give them to me so that we can persecute them. But praise be to God that like in Elisha's days, Somebody got a hold of the plans and thwarted their efforts. The unseen hand of God, the one who sets them up and who takes them down, brought them down. Because you got to understand, four more years, it would have been trouble for me and you. Real trouble. But I'm so happy that we're able to gather here today in God's house and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because God got fed up and allowed you a little more time to get it together. Just a little more time to worship him, a little more time to tell others about his soon coming. He peeled back the corridors of time that have, was ready to end and gave us a little more time. Praise be to God that he gave us a little more time to get it right. Yeah. Understand, understand. That in a nation like Elisha's, where the law of the land, where the judges of that day and time, had passed laws that were against God's people. I'm trying to explain to you the symmetry between Elisha's day and our day. They passed laws just like the Supreme Court now has just passed a law. Now, now let me be very clear. I do not support abortion. I would never tell someone, at least I pray to God, that I would never tell anyone to go and have an abortion. Stay, stay with me. But by the same token, I have no right to tell somebody what to do with their body. See, whenever you begin to legislate morality, that is the beginning of things to come. It is a beginning of the end. And so, what do you mean, Elder? So if, they, if, if the Supreme Court can pass laws that dictate to a woman what she can and can't do to her body, a moral issue that should be between her, her husband, or whomever it is, and God, that's where it should be. It's not an issue for the courts. But because it became one, because the evangelical community had one issue, and that one issue was abortion. Let's bring it to an end. We sat by, and as Christians, we said, yeah, we, we need to do that. Because killing, ain't, ain't, because we, we're killing innocent lives. Let me just bring this down to your path. Imagine if you would, and th this is just for thought. I hope and pray that it never happens. But let's just imagine that your daughter or your granddaughter, your 10-year-old granddaughter or daughter was raped by an insane person who, who, who needs all kind of medication, right? Who's deformed, who is hideous looking, who's hunchbacked. And, and, and broken and, and just malformed, got raped by that individual and became pregnant, what would you do? What would you do? The most vile person you've ever seen is now the father of your daughter's, your 10-year-old daughter's a, a baby. What would you do? Whenever a situation like this happens, and that little 10-year-old girl, let me just add something to it. And that little 10-year-old girl's life is in jeopardy. Either she aborts the baby or she dies. What decision do you make? Am I down your street yet? So what would you do? What decision do you make? Now keep in mind, there's no more abortions. What do you do? Do you go back to the clothes hanger? time and try to do your best and she dies anyway? See, there are times when we say that, you know, that God's divine providence allows things to happen. So it's all part of God's plan. 
Let me just kind of dispel that myth. It was not God's plan that a 10-year-old girl got raped. As Christians, we, 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 we sort of wrap everything up in God's plan. There are times when God will a- allow things to happen. Why? You, you, know, you know that husband or that wife that you married and they made your life miserable? Uh, not, not anybody here, so let, let me rephrase it. Do you know someone who married somebody? And they're like, you told the child, don't, don't you do this. I'm telling you, he ain't no good. He ain't going to work. He got 10 children already. And if you have one, he ain't going to take care of it. He going to leave you. Uh, I'm telling you, she may look good, but I'm telling you, here's what I'm telling you, the history. Did you get into a conversation like that, and then their life ended up being messed up in a house? Did you tell them, well, you know, child, it was God's plan that you married that bad person. No, you, I tried to tell you. See, God will allow certain things to happen because you wanted it to happen. You prayed for that person. And so God didn't say, I'm going to bring him. God says, if that's what you want, I'll sanction it. Now deal with it. And so here in America, here in America, we find ourselves in the same situation. But I need you to see what I see. Now understand, understand to the story. Elijah is inside the house sleeping. Now, it must have been early in the morning because Elisha hasn't even gotten up for his morning devotion yet. Now, it boggles my mind how these men of God that we read in the Bible are sleeping when death is knocking at their door. I, I, I don't know that I can sleep. I, I, I just don't know. Like Peter locked up, knowing he was getting ready to get beheaded, sleep. I, I, I don't know how they sleep, knowing that death is imminent. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I wish that I had the kind of faith that would allow me to go to sleep during serious troubles of times. But, but see, but understood, understand, Elijah could sleep because of the promise of our Lord that the one who said he will never leave or forsake us. He remembered that he, that, 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 uh, that Peter remembered that when he was in a storm that Jesus stood up and said, peace, be still, so he could sleep. You and I got to understand that the same God is able to bring peace in our lives. So whenever we find ourselves in situations, we just got to tell God, I'm going to trust you to bring peace in the midst of my storms. So Elisha, he understood as David said, as David would later declare, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest, don't miss this, thou preparest a table before me. Now get this, in the presence of my enemies. He pulls Elisha outside. He, he's, he's, he's concerned now. He, he's concerned. So he pulls him outside. I need you to see something, Elisha. Come outside. I need you to see. So when Elisha goes outside, he sees on every mountainside and every crook and nanny of the, um, of the mountains, he sees nothing but the enemy that has surrounded them. He says, oh, my Lord, tell me, Elisha, what are we going to do? Strangely, strangely, Elisha isn't even alarmed or even disturbed. Verse 16. Uh, see, y- 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 y'all missed it. After seeing all of the enemy that has come, the Bible says in verse 16, Elisha wasn't even concerned, wasn't fearful, wasn't afraid, wasn't even concerned. They're surrounded by a powerful armed division of the Syrian army. Their Navy SEAL team has come. The hundreds of them have covered the entire mountain, and they are standing ready to attack an unarmed Dothan, all they got are machetes against AK-40, against guns and, and, and all kind of military might. All they got are holes and machetes to fight this military. It looks bad. It is all over. They have no hope, it looks like. This unarmed village of potters and carpenters, women and children, They have come specifically to take all of them captive and make them slaves. But Elisha isn't even worried. So how can this man remain so calm? 
when, your en- when his enemies have surrounded them. I-, I wish I could have Elisha's calm. I just don't have it. He has worked a few miracles. He has worked the miracle of oil like his mentor, Elijah. He has raised a child from the dead like his mentor, Elijah. He has drawn, so he has drawn from this day. See, you got to understand that whenever God has blessed you to find your way out of your trouble, you got to draw from that experience to get through through your present experience. King is upset. And now he finally has them all covered, and he's getting ready to take them out. So he cries out, Elisha, alas, my master, how shall we do? Elisha says to him, fear not, for they that are with us are more than they that are against them. Now, I'm not a mathematician. But if there's hundreds and thousands of soldiers in the mountainside, and we got a few hundred unarmed people here, I'm not understanding what Elisha is saying, that those that are with us are more than those that are against us. I I, I would have been there, if I'm Elijah's servant, if I'm that fearful, I'm counting. I'm saying, Elisha, I don't know what you see, but but I'm seeing a mountain full of uh, enemies. And I'm seeing just you and I. What do you mean those that are with us are are more than those that are against us? What are you seeing, Elisha? I don't see it because all I see is doom. We are surrounded, and they're getting ready to come and take us away. What do you see, Elisha? In every direction. But Elisha, I mean, before Isaiah could write it, Elisha must have told his servant, when the enemy comes upon you like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him, Isaiah 59, 19. So I'm going to trust and believe that he will deliver us, servant. So Elijah doesn't run. He doesn't get scared. He simply gets a prayer off. See, there are times when you're in your situation, instead of getting scared, you got to get a prayer off so that somehow God will hear from heaven and God will lift up a standard against your enemy and provide for you a way of escape. So Elisha begins to pray and he gets a prayer off, a very simple prayer for this servant who doesn't see what he sees. And, And so Elisha says, and he gets the prayer off, he says, Lord, I pray thee, Open his eyes that he may see. In other words, let him see what I see. Doesn't pray that he would teleport them to a different time and place. He doesn't pray that all of a sudden a guns would show up for the children of Israel. He doesn't pray any of that. He just says, let my servant's eyes be open so that he can see what I see. And as soon as Elisha finishes his prayer, God opens the eyes of his servants so that he could see not just the physical realities, stay with me, not just the physical realities, but also the unseen spiritual realities. When he opens his eyes, what the servant sees He still sees all of the enemies with all of their weaponry. He sees all of that. But after God has opened his eyes, he now sees in back of them an army greater than the enemy that has come to take him out. See, that's how God is. When your enemy surrounds you like a flood, God steps in and he sends more angels to watch over and protect you than there are enemies that have come to take you out. And so he allows his servant to see all of those angels that have come. See, now, now see, God didn't send just one angel. See, God could have sent one angel and wiped out the whole military. Are you with me? God, God's angels are so powerful. These messengers that God sends to cover you, to be with you, to extract you from your dangers. He could have sent just one angel. Those big, strong angels could have stood up and just flapped his wings and just began to flap. And all of the enemies would have just been blown away. But because God wanted to display to the devil his power, God sent all kinds of angels, countless angels, and they were there surrounding the enemy. 
And so when his eyes are open, he sees these massive angels standing with their spears to their side, with their helmets on, with their breastplates, and they're glowing like the sun. He sees now what he couldn't see before. Elisha simply said, let him see what I see, Jesus. And he sees all of these angels standing ready. The Syrian army is ready for their attack. But unknown to them was that God had gotten involved in his children's affair. See, that's how God is. Whenever the devil decides he's coming to get you, God stands up. Jesus stands up. Whenever one of his children are in trouble, the Bible says, like he did with Stephen, Stephen looked up into the heavens and said, I see one that looked like the Son of God uh, standing on the right hand. See, whenever we're in trouble, Jesus stands up for us, and he gets ready to dispatch our angel to watch over us. And that's what the Bible means. See, that's what it means when the, when the bird says, don't worry about fighting your battles. Let God fight your battles because God has already sent your deliverance Amen. and your deliverer. They were ready to tear down the entire city of Dothan just to get one man, Elisha. So it would have been justified for the angels of God to kill all of them. But they do something strange. They do something very strange in the text. They do absolutely nothing. They do nothing. Strange things. See, we must come to learn that there are times when we just need to be quiet. A -a Amen? Instead of firing back, sometimes we just need to learn how to be quiet and let God fight the battle. Then Elisha does something strange as well. Elisha prays not for God to kill them, just to blind them. Verse 18. So when he finished praying, the entire Syrian army is blinded by the Lord. See, I'm so glad I don't have that kind of power. Amen, somebody. Can you imagine if God gave you and I that kind of power? There'd be so many blind people in the world. Amen. And they would be blinded not by the world, but by Christians. Child, she said this about me. And brothers would be walking around with zappers. I'm so glad that God didn't give us that kind of power. And so when he blinds them, Elisha does something even stranger. He takes them and he leads the whole Syrian army inside the walls of Samaria, verses 19 and 20. But once he gets them inside the walls of Samaria, he prays again that their eyes would be opened. And he says, Lord, open their eyes so that they could see. And when they realize, when their eyes are open, they realize that they are standing inside the camp of Samaria, completely surrounded by God's children. Are you with me? Yes. See, God has the ability to take your enemies and make them your footstools. Yes. They had come to take God's children out, and now God's children has the ability to take them out. And all of a sudden, the king of Israel, he gets bold all of a sudden. The man that has been hiding out would get involved in the battle, all of a sudden he gets brave now and comes, let's just kill them all. He has courage now that God has intervened. Where was the courage before that? Then Elijah says something as we get prepared to close. Elijah says something that I could not understand. Elijah says to the servants, go and prepare a banquet so that they may eat. He's now rehearsing the words of David before David had an opportunity to write it. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Did you get it? And so now the enemies are sitting eating and somebody must have whispered to the, the enemies probably started, are they trying to fatten us up so that they can kill us while we're fat? Did they put something in the food? Do we trust them? God just says, eat. And after they have eaten, he does something even stranger. Elisha is a strange man. He does something even stranger. 
he takes them and leads them outside the walls of Samaria and lets them go home. If you and I were in the story and you had a chance to get your enemy, what would you do? I'm going to take him out right now. Yeah, my granddad always said, whenever you got your foot on the head of a rattlesnake, you better cut it off because if you don't, he's going to bite you. My grandfather, that old Georgia soul, you, you better cut it off. But the Bible tells us, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. I will repay this story for you and I as they are going now. So understand, understand that, that, he ex- that, that this man had the ability, he lets them eat and drink. And perhaps somebody in the Syrian army uh, thought to themselves, I, I don't know why he did it. I, I don't understand what's going on. Uh, we had already laid a plan to take these people out. We had laid a plan to make Syria great again. But somehow God always interrupted our plans. Somehow he always told the children of God what was going on. And now they had the opportunity to take us out and they fed us and sent us home. I don't understand how these Christians operate. I don't know what it is about this God that they serve, but there must be something about the God that the children serve. There must be something and understand because they treated them way they did, they went back to Syria and became missionaries. Telling how good God is. See, that's how it is. That when God allows our enemies to be captured by us, he doesn't do so for us to kill them or destroy them or destroy their name or their character. He does so so that we can redeem them. So that we can be a blessing to them. Because when we bless them, we are blessing God. Because somebody will find their way that you thought was nothing and nobody that was your enemy that would come here to this church and become the head elder. We got to learn, we got to learn, family, how to treat people like Christians. We got to learn that even in this time, this day and time we live in, we got to stand up and let God be God. And let's tell everybody, wherever we go, that we serve a God that is able. And so whenever we're talking to someone who's become discouraged by what they're seeing, just tell them, just begin to pray, Lord, open his or her eyes so they can see what I see. I saw you, Jesus, working in my life when the doctor told me I had cancer. And then all of a sudden, I went back six months later, and they can't find a spot. I need for you to tell them, I need you to see what I, don't, what I see, because you can't see it right now, that when I lost my job and Bank of America sent me a foreclosure, close the note that somehow money came. I don't know where it came from, but it came and it saved my house. I need for you to see what I don't see when you couldn't see your way out, when you were just about ready to have your life taken in the accident. Somehow an angel tapped your car and you avoided the, the, the catastrophe that killed somebody else. Tell them, I need you to see what I don't see. There are angels of God surrounding us. That whenever somebody lays plans to kill us, God has already made a way of escape. That God has already provided for us. That God has already delivered us. All you got to do is see what I see. So do you, the question is, do you see what I see? I see a God that has already delivered. Praise be the name of the Lord. Father God, we are grateful. We're thankful, Jesus that you are a good God who is always on the throne, that you're a God that sees everything. You can't be caught off guard by all of the legislation that was designed to, 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 uh, to hurt your children, legislation to take away voting rights and to take away our rights to live in certain neighborhoods, to take away our rights to make our own bodily decisions. Father God, we know that you're a God that is still able to countermand all of the laws that have been put in place to nullify the victories and the gains of your children. So, Father God, we are praying, Jesus, that you would open the eyes of your children so that they can see it is no time for us to be comfortable. We're living in a strange time. We're now living in what has become a strange land. How can we, how can we, Jesus, exist? How can we be so comfortable 
in this strange land. We know that there is a place called glory that you have prepared for us. And Father God, we're praying that you would open our eyes so that we can see clearly your vision for us in our lives, so that we not only see it, but give us the power, the conviction, and the determination to walk in victory, the victory that you have given us. And so Father God, we're praying, Jesus, that above everything we could ever begin to ask of thee, that you would give us a home in your glory when you shall come. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Hymn number 100, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Please stand. Yeah. <laughs> 